the great uh, pleasure of introducing our third speaker for this evening. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> so the third of the great ideas is beauty. And for the title of uh, my talk this evening, uh, I'm looking to say that uh, beauty buries its own undertakers. How that happens and how that comes about, I hope that I will have the opportunity to explain to you a bit this evening. So earlier, uh, you've heard uh, both um, uh, Joe Chenzo and Brad Beach uh, speak uh, about and make a passing reference uh, to Socrates. And as I begin, I want to call attention to Plato's famous allegory of the cave. And in it, did it work? No. You may have to stand there. shows, we are incapable 
of seeing the objective truth of reality and in order to make progress toward any possible enlightenment. We need some way or someone to help us break the chains of our ignorance and enable us to see the light of true reality. Now, it is easy for us to use our imaginations right now to update this allegory. The shadows projected on that back wall as the only reality that we've ever known represent our own subjective experiences of our contemporary culture, the world we live in. But it is a culture only too ready to serve up a diverse buffet of ideas and opinions about virtually everything. And these ideas and opinions are competing for all of us as we make our way through our experience of life, trying to understand and discern what's really true or really good. Now, as we assay the bounty of these ever-shifting ideas before us, we have little or no critical faculty with which to make judgments about what kinds of things may truly be good or bad, true or false. In this way, our ignorance may limit us in our intellectual, true, our moral, goodness, and our aesthetic knowledge. What's beautiful? What is it? In this way, our ignorance may limit us, oh, sorry, as a result, we are most often simply led by our pleasures, whether it's in matters of truth, of good moral behavior, or in artistic judgment, well, we know what we like, and we know what pleases us. Yep, we easily conclude that truth, morality, or even aesthetic experiences are all fundamentally relative. I mean, after all, truth, goodness, and beauty are all in the eyes of the beholder. Right? Well, as you've heard in the two talks previously, there seems always to be this tension between the subjective and the object. And so earlier this evening, we've enjoyed some learned discourse on truth and goodness. And since my topic this evening is on beauty, allow me to say a few words about the philosophical and ordinary <coughs> thinking about this topic, a topic that may indeed turn out to be more important than we, at first glance, may be inclined to realize. Let me begin. <coughs> you all know the word Plato, the name of Plato. But how about Spucetus? Did it move? Yeah. It did. Yes. <laughs> so Plato versus Spucetus. And then my underlying is, hey, what makes things great? Spucetus is real, as a matter of fact. And when Plato passed away, he was running a school called the Academy, and his star pupil was Aristotle. And everyone assumed 
that the headship of the school was going to pass to Aristotle. Duh. But as it turned out, it went to Spusippus. Who was Spusippus? Spusippus was Plato's nephew. <laughs> Nepotism, alive and well, then as now. Now, my comparison would be simply to ask you, what is it that causes us to know and remember the name of Plato, but not the name of Spusippus? Short answer, Plato produced great works that have stimulated minds who have read and studied Plato for 2,500 years. Spusippus wrote some things too, but nothing we know or that have come down to us. I want to look to argue because they lacked the kind of objective quality in their writings that the writings of Plato had in theirs. Now, if you're following me, then you, I hope, will be able to see how I'm going to apply this to works of art. And so, just like Plato and Spusippus, now I want to apply it to works of art. And my first question is, are works of art great because we like them? Or do we like them because they are great? And just to make sure and to make clear that what we mean by great is that they have or possess some kind of objective qualities about them that lead us to regard them as great. Now, while it holds for Plato and Spusippus, and I want to argue also for works of art, um, uh, I think we should be able to see that this also holds for all kinds of other things that we may consider to be great. It is because they possess these distinguished <coughs> qualities that they are great, and hence they become classics. We could do the same kind of thing, not with philosophers, but with artists, with musicians, composers, with, and on and on, the possibilities go. Now, I want to uh, suggest that it is these objective qualities in things themselves that make them worthy of not only our lasting praise, but also our attention and our study. As we learn objective truths from these works, it's not the whole of truth, but we learn things that are, small t, true from them cumulatively. They give us a measure of that enlightenment that breaks the chains of our ignorance and moves us beyond the false subjectivism and relativism of living in the dark, in the cave. So we see here that there is this subjective, objective tension concerning beauty. Now, I want to point out that when we think about art, it divides initially into two aspects. A creative aspect, the artist making a work, and the appreciation aspect. This is those of us who are the audience who come upon great works of art, whether they be paintings, uh, theater, films, uh, pieces of music, and so forth. Beauty, primarily, in a kind of uh, popular discussion, concerns the latter. So that will be my primary focus. Now, in Mortimer Adler's Six Great Ideas, he points out right away, right from the start, that there is the pleasing, 
That's the subjective aspect. But he also talks about the admirable, like Plato's works, as opposed to those of Spiocephus. We see then that the subjective aspect leads us to the phrase that we all know so well and we hear repeated so easily. It's true, right? That beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Now there is the objective side, as I've looked to suggest to you, and here is the definition of beauty from Thomas Aquinas. He says, beauty is that which, when seen, pleases. The pleasing idea should suggest that it's subjective. But if you read Aquinas in that way, you would be doing him a disservice. Just as I may use this expression, Joe, I'll use yours, that I see that the walls are beige, I also may ask, do you see what I mean? This is one kind of seeing. This is another kind of seeing. And you would grossly misunderstand and misrepresent Aquinas if you thought that by his expression, he's saying beauty is that which when seen pleases. It doesn't mean that. Aquinas is clearly referring to our intelligence and the intelligence that we bring as we have the encounter and the experience with a work of art. Now, this expression, beauty is that which when seen pleases, leads Aquinas then to speak about the three characteristics of beauty. The first of these is integrity. It's also sometimes called the perfection of a thing. And shortly I will have some slides of uh, some great sculpture to share with you. It's that our intelligence, that's the seeing, delights in the integrity, wholeness, or fullness of a thing's nature. The second of the three characteristics of beauty is proportion or harmony. Notice, it's our intelligence that delights, there's the pleases, in the order, balance, unity, and harmony of a thing's nature. And finally, there's radiance or clarity. Our intelligence delights in the intelligible radiant splendor or clarity of being in a thing's nature. In other words, it's our intelligence having an encounter with a kind of, this word will be key for us, intelligibility of a really good work of art. Now, as Dr. Beach pointed out before, that we have to apply these categories differently in different cases. I'm using a different image than his, but the breakfast that might be appropriate for a lumberjack <laughs> would not be the same breakfast appropriate to a sedentary office worker. In a similar way, we have to apply integrity, proportion, and radiance differently to different kinds of art and different works. And so, we can ask, is beauty, beauty relative or not? And I think the final answer is, well, yes and no. No, it is not just relative to the subjective taste of an individual. 
again, as Dr. Beach mentioned, tastes or, um, and no, and I think this was uh, Dr. Vincenzo also, um, that not all opinions are equal, that some are more informed and others may lack that. So it's not relative simply to the eyes of, of the beholder. Someone may say, I don't like opera. That's legitimate because it's taste. What you can't say is, opera stinks. <laughs> and those are quite different. And so my point is that yes, Did I get those factors? Yeah, no, it's not. So yes, there is the three criteria of beauty, and these are objective qualities, notice, in a thing's nature. It's about the thing itself. And these are not relative simply to taste, but to the intelligence and the perception of one viewing it. Here is a quote taken from an early work of Jacques Maritain, my favorite philosopher, a French Catholic philosopher from the 20th century. And this is an early work, 1920. Maritain died in 1973, so you can see this is quite early. He says, however beautiful a creative, created thing may be, it can appear beautiful to some and not to others. That's the subjective quality. Because it is beautiful only, this is the aletheia, right? The disclosing or the revealing and concealing under certain aspects. And some people may discern this and other people may not discern it at all. That's not saying anything negative against the artwork. Let's have a look. We've talked about Socrates and Plato. I hope you can see it. This is from Praxiteles, 4th century BC, right around the same time as Plato and Aristotle. You should be able to see clearly enough that that's beautiful. And it's beautiful we can see easily enough by thinking about the integrity and the proportion. Everything about it is rather perfect. You can't see it very clearly, but climbing up that uh, uh, tree is a lizard, and the Soroctonos is uh, Apollo, the lizard killer, or lizard slayer. But let me jump now 1,800 years or more, no, how many? Uh, yeah, 19. And here's another one. Look at this from Michelangelo. Here's Apollo. Some people have said that it is a David Apollo. It's in 1530. And the idea is that uh, Michelangelo may have been experimenting with this before doing his famous uh, statue of David. Um, now, what you should see here and going back to Praxiteles is, in almost 2,000 years, there isn't all that much that has changed when we look at the beauty of one or the other, especially concerning the integrity and the proportion. But now look, now I've taken you to 1960, Alberto uh, Giacometti, and here is Walking Man. Now this work of sculpture looks nothing like the other two, and yet it becomes possible for us to see in it a certain radiance of intelligence, a shining forth. It doesn't have the proportion or the integrity as those older forms of sculpture, but that doesn't make it any less beautiful. We have to view it in a more expanded way captured in a 1960s experience by this artist who's trying to say something about contemporary human life. I leave it to you 
to give thoughts about how that artwork might speak to you about the contemporary experience. Now, I made a passing reference just now quickly to radiance. But mostly, I've talked about the integrity and proportion. What about radiance? Whatever is Aquinas talking about with that? What is it, and where does it come from? The short answer, it comes from the intelligibility in the object, which is going to be a reflection of the intelligence of the creator. But what's this intelligibility? And where does it come from? And the answer now, whether in a small c or a big c, whether we're talking about it in terms of nature, or whether we're talking about it in terms of great art. I think the answer is from a creator. Small c, if we're talking about an artist, make it <coughs> big c if we're talking about the creator of all, the one who is intelligence and intelligibility itself. And so I want to take just a few moments to talk quickly about the creator and creation. And I'm going to bring this back in an analogous way. Remember, I see and I see. We have an analogy between the greater and the universe and the human artist and his or her creation. The first thing I want to point out about the universe, if indeed it is made by a creator, is that it is flooded with intelligibility. <coughs> We've all heard the poem, to see a heaven in a grain of sand. The revealing, the aletheia. Uh, and so there is this intelligibility everywhere, even though what we come to see, whether it's in creation or in great works of art, may be limited by our own chains. As Joe mentioned, you want to learn how to listen? Listen to the musician. You want to learn how to see? Follow the painter. Etc. They're not making this up. These are not constructions of reality. These are perceptions. And then, as they set about to create, they reflect who and what they are in their creation. And so at the center of God's creation is the spirit incarnate human person. We have encounters with the world, with one another. We absorb things. We experience things differently. And so no two works of art will e uh, from, uh, from different artists will ever be the same. They're always going to be a unique reflection of the individual artist who makes them. Trained eyes know how to pick out a Picasso from a Van Gogh, or here a Mahler from a Brooklyn. Now there are three factors that we need to consider. One is that we are all knowers. Second, that some of us are creators. And then third, that we are all, in one way or another, an audience for great works of art whether they be film, theater, poetry, music, painting, sculpture, carry on. And so as knowers, we have poetry. I put that word in quotes because that's Maritan's term, and it really only works 
from a philosophical tradition that is going to say that human mind isn't just a function of the brain, that we also have an intellect, and that that intellect gives us a capacity to see, and we see differently than other animals without the intelligence and the highly developed brain that humans have. Intelligentiated sense, an expression of Mary Tan's where he's basically pointing out that our sensual experiences are not like the sensual experiences of other animals. Because we are, in our being, shot through with our spiritual nature. And as a result of that, all of our sense experiences are on a completely transformed and different level than happens for those who lack intellects. And finally, what he means by spiritualized emotion is, all of us know what it is to have an emotion in a moment. We feel it. But what about later? What about when we're not experiencing that emotion in the moment? Is it simply gone? Or does it become part of our fiber of who we are? I'm blessed this evening that my wife and all of my children are here. And I'm telling you that this was a conversation on one occasion that I had with my daughter, Rachel, on the occasion a couple of weeks after she was married. And she was home talking with me, just the two of us. She had moved in. It was a different, a new place. And she asked me innocently, Dad, does the homesickness ever go away? And the answer is, no. <laughs> and if you, if you understand what I mean by that, then you understand what spiritualized emotion is. That all of us go through experiences of life, and we are continually filled with many emotions that become part of our being and part of who we are even though we may not consciously remember them. But they affect us, shot through to the fiber of our being. They determine who we are and how we respond, both to our world, to other human beings, and to great works of art. As artistic creators, we need what Mary Tan calls poetic knowledge. It's a knowledge special to the great creative artists. And they infuse their work using artistic skill to pass along that poetic knowledge. And finally, as audience, we are the ones who have these instead experiences. When we view great beauty in nature, this is a reflection of the divine artist. And when we view beauty in art, it is a reflection of the human artist. But again, as Dr. Vincenzo pointed out, that being is filled with mystery and that we have the capacity to see great things, a heaven in a world of sand that goes beyond the simple, mere objectivity of that reality itself. Before I close, let's quickly look at a couple of pieces, pieces of sculpture again. This is from the tomb of Lorenzo de' Medici, 
1533. This is only a detail. Take a look. Watch. I'm taking you forward 350 years. You all know this one. <laughs> right? Isn't that great? It's not called The Thinker. That one is. And here we are, 1880, from Auguste Rodin. You know this. It's beautiful. Check this one out from two years later. You know this. It's beautiful. I just came back last week from my daughter Lauren's house and hanging there in the wall of her bedroom. And I looked at it and I said, oh, I'm so glad you have this. This is a beautiful piece. Wait, there's a catch. I'm just warning you ahead of them. Now this is 1852. These, we might say, are Rodin the Wonderful. Now watch. Look what happens when we go here. I hope you can see that. This is two years later. This is Rodin again, and Eternal Spring, it's called. And yet, it conveys, it oozes this passionate sensuality of man and woman. Some may look at that and judge it almost on the verge of obscene. You'll see why I say that in a moment. <laughs> and my last slide before my conclusion. First, I'll give you the title. This is from 1887, and it's also from Rodin. I love the title of this book. Notice I'm not showing it to you again. <laughs> the title of this work is She Who Was Once the Helmet Maker's Beautiful Wife. is going to be, is that a beautiful work of art or not? Listen to a critic. This is November of 1916, 102 years ago. I've just excerpted. This is a degenerate work of art. First, because it is ugly, no woman is ever beautiful when in a state of decay. And in such decay, as here represented, she is repellent. None but a cynical vulgarian without pity could for days look upon such a naked, suffering, shivering, shrinking rag of humanity. Instead of giving her a little money and let her go her way with his blessing, he must needs force her for a pittance to undress against all the finer instincts in her, which must have rebelled to make a pitiable expose of all the abject decay that come to all of us in time. Thanks a lot. <laughs> no amount of hypocritical argumentation 
under the cry of liberty and art, do what you want, will condone the representing of the body of a woman in any other than in its most perfect form. This work by Rodin has shocked the normal public. It still shocks it and always will shock it because it is intellectually monstrous and spiritually degenerate. Well, is this last piece of sculpture beautiful or not? We just heard what one of Rodin's critics had to say. Let me close. By quoting a brief section from a book written in 1961, it was a very popular book by Robert Penline, Stranger in a Strange Land. Two friends are looking at she who was once the helmet maker's beautiful wife, and they're talking about it. And here's Ben, and he says, you know, I wouldn't be rude to the old woman who posed for that. What I can't understand is a so-called artist having the gall to pose somebody's great-grandmother in her skin and you having the bad taste, he says to his friend, to want it. friend replies. Hey, anyone can see a pretty girl. An artist can look at a pretty girl and see the old woman she will become. A better artist can look at an old woman and see the pretty girl she used to be. But a great artist can look at an old woman and portray her exactly as she is and force the viewer to see the pretty girl she used to be. But more than that, he can make anyone with the sensitivity of an armadillo see that this lovely young girl is still alive, prisoned inside her ruined body. He can make you feel the quiet, endless tragedy that there was never a girl born who ever grew older than 18 in her heart. No matter what the merciless hours of life have done to her. Look at her, Ben. Look at her. Growing old doesn't matter to you and to me. But it does matter to them. <coughs> Look at her. And so, I hope now you will share with we can see how beauty buries its own critics, its own
25, you've been here for two hours. A good movie might be two hours and 20 minutes, but no, as King Henry VIII once said to one of his wives, don't worry, I won't keep you long. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, if there are any questions, we have five minutes. Thank you very much.